Well, please turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 12. And as you turn there, just a reminder that this, this morning we're participating in the Lord's Supper together at the end of our service. And so uh, the Lord's table at Bethany is open to all who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. would encourage you to uh, partake in the Lord's Supper with us this morning if that's you. And we encourage people to be a, a part of a local church. Uh, But you don't have to be part of our local church in order to participate in the Lord's Supper with us. And so when we stand in a moment to to uh, to read God's word, you and you didn't if you didn't get uh, some of the elements as you you walked in, you may uh, get some of those at the the back of the the rooms here. Also, as you're turning to First Samuel chapter 12, I want to just kind of encourage you with with a couple things. Uh, One, as we've talked about before. Um, well, some of this we've talked about before, some we haven't. We have, we have two elders who are going to be stepping down at the end of April as our church year comes to a close. So our church year goes from May 1 through the end of April, and we've already talked before about Kent Cloder stepping down in April, retiring as a pastor here, and so he'll be stepping off as an elder. And we just want to encourage you on April 16th in room 101B, we're going to be having a celebration for him after church and encourage you to, to write a card thanking him and Janelle for their their faithful ministry to our our church. And then also, uh, Kevin Martin will be stepping down at the end of April. And I'll say a little bit more about Kevin in a a few minutes, but on April 23rd, after our Sunday evening service, our annual meetings that night, we're going to be holding a a thank you for him as well. And so encourage you to write a card, a note of appreciation for him and Sarah also uh, for uh, for that evening. One more thing before we begin reading the text together. Just want to let you have a little bit of an update on how things are going with our our church replanting ministry. We gave you an update, I think, three weeks ago. Told you that the review committee has been formed, is looking at Jordan Embry for that position of of church plant pastor. Let me tell you a little bit more about this this ministry. Uh, You may have noticed that whenever I talk about this, the work in Chillicothe, Rome, sometimes I say, church revitalization. Sometimes they say church plant. I use a lot of different words, and some people have said, well, what do you mean? I said, I don't know. And um, we, we talked about this at the Elder Retreat in February, and we determined, hey, the best word to, u- to be used to describe the ministry that we're engaging in, and that doesn't mean I'll consistently use this phrase, uh, but the, really to just, the, wor- the phrase to describe what we're doing is a church replant. One organization described a church replant this way. They said it's a process in which members of a church facing closure discern God's leadership to dissolve their current ministry and work with other churches or denominational bodies to begin a new church for a new season of ministry in their community. And that's really what's taking place by God's grace uh, with, with this work. And so I want to give you some big milestones that either have happened or will be happening if the Lord wills in the coming weeks and months. So the, the first thing was Rome Baptist Church stops meeting there and begins to meet with us. That happened at the end of December, beginning of January, and that has just been such a, a huge blessing to be able to, to worship together. Uh, another thing that happens after that is we're forming a, a new leadership team to really oversee this ministry. So part of that, of course, is what we've already talked about, uh, identifying a man to help lead that work, and so we have that review committee that's that's looking at Jordan Embry, and he's per, he and Leah and, and our, our church leadership. We're all kind of prayerfully considering that, and then not just that position, but also a, a leadership team, a shepherding team that will really kind of do the ministry and kind of oversee the the different things that are engaged in in this uh, replant. So that's something that's ongoing. We also have been working on developing a budget for the church replant. That's, that's begun, and at our April meeting, it's going to be approved by uh, the church body, Lord willing. And then we're also going to bring some things to this church body at our April meeting for the members here at Bethany Community to approve. So the, the budget I've already mentioned, the church plant or church replant pastor position, uh, that's something that this body is going to approve through approving the budget. And then at some point, maybe, we don't have an exact date for this, but it could all be simultaneously. It could be a little different. We're also going to bring the the man for that position for the church body to affirm. We're also, at some point, going to present Rome Baptist Church with kind of a formal proposal. We'll say, okay, here's, here's what we 
think we can do, and we've been trying to work during the spring. We told them we're going to work during the spring to kind of put some some, some pieces in a row and, and see if we can move forward on this ministry, and then we're going to bring them a proposal and have them vote to uh, affirm that, and they'll put in place a temporary constitution, and that temporary constitution will allow that that church to continue to exist, so their their assets and their, their, their legal entity will exist apart from Bethany Community Church, but our elders will have shepherding oversight over that, that body. And then we'll, again, the timeline, not quite sure of, but the, the church uh, will, the, the kind of leadership team will uh, develop kind of a timeline for things. They'll begin to identify a launch group of people from our church and from Rome Baptist Church and other people in the community, perhaps. They'll begin to identify that, that core group. There'll be a, a time of meeting together, maybe a Sunday school class during uh, some, some portion of the, of the year. And then at, at some point, they'll continue to engage in community outreach. And at some point here in the future, Lord willing, they'll begin to have services in Rome, Chillicothe. And then they'll develop a new constitution. And then at some point, again, Lord willing, as they've developed a new constitution, as they become financially independent, as they have elders in place, they'll become their own autonomous church, and we will rejoice in that. So, uh, as that ministry becomes self-sustaining. So, uh, that's, that's, and a lot of that is, a lot of the decisions and timeline, that's going to be some, some things that that new leadership team, that new group decides, and we as, as Bethany Community Church are just going to be Uh, at some point, just cheerleaders, encouraging them in that work. So it's kind of exciting to think about. Whenever we planted our church, I remember one evening, Tom Robinson, who was the elder chairman at Bethany Baptist Church at the time, presented the vision for Bethany Community Church, cool PowerPoint, all these different things in a timeline. And then over the, the whole timeline, the last slide was the phrase, if the Lord wills, kind of superimposed on all of that. And so everything I've just said, what? if the Lord wills, superimposed and all of that. And so we'll see how God continues by his grace. But what an exciting time it's been thus far. We're in 1 Samuel. We are looking this year at an overview of 1 and 2 Samuel, and we've arrived at 1 Samuel chapter, the end of chapter 11 and into chapter 12. And this morning we're going to read verses 6 through 18. And so if you're able to, if you'd stand with me in honor of God as we read his word together, 1 Samuel chapter 12, beginning of verse 6. The people have, have gathered to, and they've, they've renewed the kingdom, and Samuel's giving a farewell address, and he says in verse 6, and Samuel said to the people, the Lord is witness, who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous deeds of the Lord that he performed for you and for your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt, the Egyptians oppressed them. Then your fathers cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God, and he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. And they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served the Baals and the Asherah, but now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies that we may serve you. And the Lord sent Jerubel and Barak and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hands of your enemies on every side, and you lived in safety. And when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. And now, behold, the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Now, therefore, stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain, and 
You shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord, and asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. You may be seated. May God encourage us through the reading of his word. Heavenly Father, we are mindful today that we are your servants. We recognize your power. And as we think about our our role in in the, the church, our role in the lives of people that we love, we recognize that ultimately we are simply stewards. And so we, we pray that we would take the stewardship of ministry that you've given us as husbands, as wives, as children, as grandparents, as friends. We would take the, the roles that you've given us and, and serve faithfully with joy, recognizing your great strength and power. And we, we entrust all of our lives into your hands, your gracious, kind hands. We pray that by the enabling work of your Spirit, we would seek to, to glorify you. And we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All human endeavor, all ministries and jobs and tasks come to an end. All of the, the, the ministries that we have, all the jobs that we have are, are finite. They, they have a, a finishing point. We think about the, the ministries that God has entrusted into us, and we realize that our, our jobs, our tasks, even though they're, they're finite, we're not judged on our success by how strong we begin them, but on how we, we finish, how we serve to the end. It's not how enthusiastically we begin, but how faithfully we finish that our ministries are judged, all the ministries that God has entrusted to us. And, and some of us have been entrusted with the ministry of, a, of being a husband. Some of us have been entrusted with the ministry of being a student or a, a deacon or an elder or a Sunday school teacher or a nursery worker. There are all sorts of ministries that God has entrusted to us, and we recognize we're going to be judged. Our faithfulness is going to be judged, not how enthusiastically we begin, but on how, how faithfully we finish. We want to finish well. We want to finish in a way that brings glory to God. We talked about earlier this morning, we have two elders who are going to be finishing their official ministry of shepherding as elders here at the end of April. We've talked before about Kent and him retiring at the end of April after serving over, I think, over 12 years as an elder here at Bethany. And many of you have expressed your, your sadness as you think about that chapter of his ministry coming to a close. There's, there's sadness that accompanies that. I mentioned earlier that, that Kevin's going to be uh, stepping down as an elder as his term ends here in April, and uh, Kevin has been shepherding as, as an elder in, in my life since I was 21 years old. So he's been shepherding at Bethany Baptist Church since 1992, and then with the church plant uh, came over and, and served as an elder here as well. And so it's a little, uh, you know, there's a little s- fear on my part. I, I haven't been uh, in a church where Kevin hasn't been in a shepherding role since I was 21 years old. And that was a while ago, right? So that's the little nervousness that I have as I think about that as well. But it's inevitable. All human endeavor, all human ministries come to a close, and we, we turn the chapter, and Kevin's going to be continuing to, to shepherd people at BCC, but also going to be spending more time traveling and shepherding his kids, and so his, his shepherding ministry is going to look different, right? And that's normal. That's how all human ministry works. In God's kindness, though, what does he allow? In God's kindness, he allows our, our finite ministries to have eternal reward. As Paul puts it in in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. In other words, God allows these these things that are are temporary, that that we see, he, he allows us to experience that, but we also know that as we engage in those things, we are also engaging in things that are going to have eternal reward, things that we can't see that are going to to have reward into eternity. To experience this finite world, we are also thinking about eternity. Now, the question is, 
that we have. How do we get from here to there? How do we get from this, this moment right now where we have these, these temporary ministries that God's entrusted to us, how do we do those ministries, be it as a, a student or be it as a, a coach or be it as an employee or an employer, how do, I, how do I do these temporary things that God has called me to do as his, his steward? How do I do those things in a way that there is eternal reward? Maybe you're young. And, and this morning, it seems like your life is infinitely long, right? And yet, as you begin life, as you do whatever it is that God has called you to do, it's, it's helpful to remember, okay, there's, there's an end point to this. My, my life is not infinitely long. Maybe, like me, you're, you're more middle-aged, and uh, you're you're speaking in cliches all the time now about how quickly time flies. You're watching those progressive commercials about becoming like your parents, and you're laughing just a little bit too hard about those things, right? You know? And you recognize, okay, yeah, yeah, life, life has gone very, like the first half of ministry has gone really quickly, and, and, and the, the end isn't as far off as I, I thought it was when I began, or whatever ministry it is, and so okay, I need to be thinking about how do I finish this well? Maybe you're older. And you're coming to, to the end of, of some ministries, or, or maybe you're younger and coming to the end of some ministries, and think, like, how, how do I, the, the end is approaching, how do I finish well? Now, here in the text, we see Samuel coming to the end of one portion of his ministry. And, and here's the main idea that I want us to think about that I think helps us finish well. Here's what I want us to keep in mind. We serve, here's the main idea, we serve as temporary stewards of a minuscule portion of God's vast, eternal ministry to his people. That's a very helpful thing for us to keep in mind. We serve as, as temporary stewards of a, of a minuscule, a, a tiny portion of God's vast, eternal ministry to his people. Samuel here, in his ministry, his, his God's covenantal people are undergoing a change. There's going to be a king to lead them instead of a judge, instead of Samuel. And so Samuel has some words to the people here that help them think about how they're to approach this, this new king. And as we examine his words, words that point us to this new king, that ultimately point us to the covenant king, to, to Jesus Christ, we, we see some important truths about ministry as we engage in it, even as we're members of the new covenant. So again, we're seeing Samuel who's in the Old Covenant, pointing to this, ultimately to the, the, the New Covenant King, the New Covenant King that we are stewards of, and we learn some important truths about how we engage in ministry in a way that we can finish well. So here are some, some truths I want us to think of, five truths to encourage us as we think about finishing well. Number one, number one, check your expiration date. Check your expiration date. Look at uh, chapter 11. As you look at chapter 11, we're, we looked th- at chapter 11 through verse 11 last time we were in Samuel. And remember, Saul had been appointed king, anointed king, and, and it says at the end of chapter 10, there were some worthless fellows who said, how can this man save us? And they despised him, didn't bring him any present, but Saul kind of held his peace. And then we come into chapter 11, and Saul defeats the Ammonites, and there's this great victory that God brings about. And then we come to chapter 12, and the people said to Samuel, who is it that said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. And so they're referring back to the men of chapter 10, verse 27. Where are those worthless fellows? They've, they have uh, disrespected the king. Let's put them to death. And Saul, here's what they're saying. And he says in verse 13, no, no, no. Not a man shall be put to death this day. For today, the Lord has worked salvation in Israel. And so this is really the height of Saul's Rain, sadly, as it begins. First of all, he is theologically astute. He rightly recognizes that God has brought about salvation. And he says, look, God has saved his people. This is not a day for putting people to death. God has, has saved his people, and we're going to recognize that. There's also wisdom that he shows here. Look, I'm beginning my reign. I'm going to show some grace here. And so I'm, I'm not going to put anyone to death today. God has wrought salvation, and so there's going to be no 
recrimination. This is a day of, of grace. And Samuel confirms what Saul has said. Verse 14 of chapter 11. Samuel says, yeah, let's do this. Let's go to Gilgal. And this is this, this place we've talked about before. This, this place that's a central location in the nation. Let's, let's go to Gilgal and there renew the kingdom. That is, reaffirm our covenant commitment to Yahweh. And so, verse, verse 15, all the people go to Gilgal, and they, they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal, and they sacrificed peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. And so, Samuel leads them in this process of confirming their covenantal relationship with God under this new structure. Samuel says, new king, new structure, new leadership, let's reaffirm our commitment to Yahweh. See, Samuel recognizes that his ministry, at least in terms of its political nature and leadership, has come to a close. You look at chapter 12, verse 2, and when Samuel's, he's about to start talking to them, he says, I, I've walked before you from my youth until this day. He says, I'm old now, and, I've, I've, and we would, would be in the same position as the people who are here in Israel. We've seen Samuel, as we've gone through this overview of 1 Samuel, we've seen him from whenever, before he's even born, we've seen him as a little boy with this cute little robe that his mother would bring him, and now we see him in his old age. See, Samuel recognizes that his ministry had an expiration date, and that, that date had arrived. His ministry had an end to it, and so does yours, and so does mine. And if we're wise, we'll recognize that. You know, a, a pixel is a, a tiny little dot on a screen, right? A, a pixel is the, the tiniest measurement that you can, can make on a, on a screen. And if, if something is, is high def, it, it means it has a a concentrated, a dense number of pixels in a smaller amount of space. And so the more pixels you have in a, a smaller amount of space, the denser they are, the, the crisper the picture, right? I remember the, the first time, maybe you remember the first time you saw a high-definition TV and, and just kind of watching it, and it almost, it, it, it felt fake or something. It was just so, in terms of like how, how crisp it was, it, it just, it, it was almost distracting when you watched it, right? Now imagine you were to, to, to come over to my house. I said, hey, I'd love for you to come over and watch. I've, I've got this great new TV. It's, in, it's ultra, 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 whatever it is, high def, four gajillion whatevers, and, and uh, we're going to watch uh, some movie with amazing cinematography. We're going we're to watch Return of the King, and then we're going to see this amazing movie, and you came over, and it was just this amazing crisp picture, and you said, wow, Daniel, we pay you too much. I said, don't worry about it. I got a deal, <laughs> and we watched the movie, right? But imagine you came over, and uh, you came over, and I turned on the TV, and, and some of the pixels were distorted. Maybe there's a, a little pixel, and, it, and instead of just being a little pixel, it, was, it had been stretched. And you look at it, that, that seems off. Now the, the picture's distorted because one of the pixels is too large. Or imagine you came over, and I, I turned on the TV, and we started watching the movie, and, and you heard the sound, but you didn't see anything. You said, Daniel, what, what's going on? I said, oh, there's, I just have one pixel on. He said, well, why? I said, oh, that's a really good pixel. It's my favorite pixel. So that, that pixel's nothing. It's, it's just a tiny dot. Only, the pixel's only important in, in the context of all the other pixels. You and I are, are tiny little pixels. And it's only... It's only when we recognize that that we can engage in effective ministry, right? There was a, I was thinking about this this last week. There was a, a conference this past week, and I'm not going to say the name of the conference or the name of the people involved because it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it, it, it could be anyone. It could be us. It could be somebody else. It could be a small conference or a big conference. This is a big conference with a big bunch of big speakers, and there was a, uh, the teaching pastor at this church who's, very famous, getting older, having some health problems. He had to miss a portion of the conference. And one of his friends was speaking in the, the session that he was supposed to be speaking in. And his, his friend was trying to honor him, right? It's an older guy struggling with health. And his, his friend was trying to honor him and talk about how important it was. But he, but he said something that 
he worded it in a very unfortunate way, I think. He said this. He said, essentially, he goes, I, he's talking about his famous friend. He says, I think 5% of my friend is worth more than the whole evangelical world put together, right? That's not a great way. Even, even speaking hyperbol- hyperbolically or, or trying to, to honor someone, that's not a true statement, right? No matter how godly your friend is, no matter how much God has used him for the health of his church, your friend's a pixel. You're a pixel. So my word of application to you here as we think about how to finish a ministry well, constantly check your expiration date. You are not a a Twinkie. You are a glass of milk that has already been sitting out for a couple hours, right? (laughs) It's helpful to remember. Even if you're young, it feels like you're at the beginning of life and ministry. You are headed to the end. You have a shelf life. You have an expiration date. You're a pixel, and that is a very, very good thing to embrace. Why? A couple reasons. Grasping that truth helps us remember, first of all, I'm, I'm a steward. This is something that someone else has given me. It's not mine to keep. It's, it's something that I have for a, a portion of time. It keeps me, me humble as I recognize that, right? I, I see the, the vastness of God's covenant ministry plan. It also helps me because I, I put my identity not in my ministry but in Christ. I put my identity not in my ministry but in Christ, You see, if I put my identity in my ministry and that ministry comes to a close, it can be very bewildering. You say, well, I'm a a mom. That's that's who I am. I'm a a dad or I'm a pastor or I'm a Sunday school teacher or I'm a missionary or I'm I'm a nursery. Whatever whatever ministry is, if that becomes our sole identity, it's going to be very disorienting to us when it comes to a close. Whatever ministry it is that God has given you is, is not eternal. But if you say, well, my identity is in Christ, that's very helpful. That's an identity that is ours for eternity. We're going to be in eternity in Christ, no other way but in Christ. It also helps us have a a better focus on our priorities as we recognize that our our ministry has an expiration date. In other words, if if my ministry has an expiration date, I better be focusing on the things that are most important, right? It also helps me if I'm a younger person. Recognizing that I have an expiration date makes me say, okay, I need to kind of pay attention to some, some people who are older than me and, and, and ask them, hey, how have you handled these things? And, and how do you balance these different things? And I mean, don't always tell them, hey, because you're so old, help me. But, but it also helps those of us who are a little further along in ministry recognize that, that we need to invest in younger people. And we need to, to give younger people leadership opportunities that we need to make sure that we are stepping away creating spaces for other workers because we're not going to be here forever. God's, God has an expiration date for us. Here's my second encouragement to you to, to finish well. Number two, guard your integrity. Guard your integrity. They have engaged in this, the sacrificing and there's the, the peace offerings before the Lord at the end of chapter 11. There's Saul and all the men of, of Israel are rejoicing greatly. And, and then it seems maybe this is the same moment. Maybe it's at least a similar context. The, the, the narrative doesn't seem to shift that greatly. And verse 1 of chapter 12, as Israel is gathered, Samuel says, look, I, I've obeyed your voice, Right? I've done what you've asked me to do. Now there's this king, and, and the king walks before you. I'm old and gray. We've looked at verse 2 earlier. And then he says in verse 3, okay, now here's what I want you to do. Testify against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom, I've, whom, I, whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? And from whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with it? Testify against me, and I will restore it to you. And there's this kind of legal back and forth. And what he's doing is he's drawing a contrast between himself and the things, remember what he said in, in chapter 8 about what a king would do. Remember, the king's going to take, 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 take. And Samuel says three or four times here, have I taken anything? Have I taken anything? Have I oppressed? Have I taken anything? Have I taken this? No, no, no. Right? And so there's this back and forth language here where he asks, they respond no. He says, confirm it. They confirm it. He says, okay, I'm willing to rectify 
anything that I've defrauded you of? And they say, no, there's, there's nothing. Integrity in ministry allows us to finish well. Integrity in ministry allows us to live a life that reflects the gospel that we are proclaiming, that allows us to finish ministry with joy. Paul's integrity in ministry, for example, allowed him to, to point to Christ and Christ alone. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we don't lose heart, but we've renounced disgraceful, underhanded way. So we pr- refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Then he says in verse 5, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, what he's saying is here, I have lived my life in such a way that I can stand before you with a clear conscience, and as I proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to you, there's nothing between me and my words of proclamation that get in the way of Jesus Christ being seen and known. And church, what I would encourage you with is that reality. Whatever ministry God has entrusted to you as a teacher, as a discipler, as a mom, as a dad, as a student in school, whatever ministry it is that God has entrusted to you, guard your integrity because it is more precious than you realize. As a ministry comes to a close, your integrity is something that you can cling to that gives you hope that you've been faithful in what God has entrusted to you. When, you're, when your job is, is difficult and it's coming to a close and, and your, your employer is beginning to accuse you of things and say terrible things about you, as it comes to your integrity, is something you can cling to and say, by God's grace, I've had integrity in this situation. I have a clear conscience that no matter what is happening externally, I've honored the Lord in this. It allows you to finish well. Frankly, I struggle with disillusionment at times when I I look at the evangelical world. Sometimes I get excited about a a teacher and his ministry, and and then he says something, or I hear about something he does, or I find out about something he said that was very unwise, or something he did that was very unwise, and I, I can struggle with just getting disillusioned very easily. Randy Alcorn, 20 years ago, wrote an incredibly insightful article, and he he called out deceptive practices in the church. He talked about Christian ghostwriting, money paid to Christian leaders for their endorsement, these ridiculous speaking fees. And his, his main point was that secrecy was undermining the gospel. He says, look, uh, I, I, I'm not taking pleasure in addressing these issues. He wrote, I, I hope it will serve Christ's body by initiating some much-needed self-examination and dialogue. Sadly, that didn't take place, right? And many of the the ministries that he kind of called out no longer exist. They didn't finish well. For those of you who are younger, don't underestimate integrity. Don't underestimate how crucial your integrity will be at the end of whatever ministry God calls you to. Now, other flashier things will seem like the, the ticket to success, right? Other flashier things will, will see like, okay, that's what I want. I want the acclaim of other students. I want admiration. I want a, a broader influence. I need greater knowledge, or I, I need greater recognition or a, 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 a more charisma. But those things are not the things that are going to make you happy as you conclude your ministry at whatever point God calls it to an end. Proverbs 22.1, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. A good name is to be chosen over great riches. Proverbs 22, 1. Guard your integrity in ministry. 
for the sake of your long-term effectiveness, guard your integrity like precious gold. Don't lie. Don't compromise the truth. Don't take steps down the, the path of immorality or adultery. Keep your finances with integrity. Because just like Samuel, we want to keep our integrity intact. And if there's any indication that we've wronged someone, what do we need to do? We need to be willing to rectify it. So we want to guard our integrity, and we also want to admit sin, right? As we sin, we want to be willing to admit that, guard our integrity. A lack of integrity is not a sin that can ever be forgiven. God's quick to forgive and can even use that. We want to finish well. We need to guard our integrity. Number three, a third thing I'd encourage you to do, call people to love and covenant faithfulness. Call people to love of God and covenant faithfulness. Let's, let's look at verses 6 through 21 here. And, and this is, for, for a ministry to finish well, this must be the beginning of our ministry. This must be the middle of our ministry. This must be the end goal of our ministry, a love of God and covenant faithfulness. There are going to be a lot of things that come up in our lives, a lot of ministry initiatives we can do, a lot of, a lot of things we can try to accomplish, but, but love of God and, and faithfulness to him must be the, the beginning, middle, and end of, of all of the ministry that we do. And look here at, at Samuel and how he engages in the people that he's ministering to. Look, look at the text. I want you to notice, first of all, that he reminds them of their past and of God's faithfulness. Look at verse 8. Beginning in verse 8, he begins talking with them about how they have sinned and how God has been faithful. So he talks, first of all, for example, about their time in, in Exodus. In verse 8, he says, he says uh, Jacob went into Egypt, the Egyptians oppressed them, and your fathers cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in the place. So, so there was oppression, the fathers cried out to the Lord, the Lord delivered. So God was faithful. And then you come to verses 9 through 11. You have the, the time of, of the judges. It says, they forgot the Lord their God. He sold them the hand of Sisera, the commander of the army of Hazor, and the hand of the Philistines, and the hand of the king of Moab. And they fought against them. They cried out to the Lord and said, we've sinned because we've forsaken the Lord and have served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, but now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies that we may serve you. And the Lord sent Jerubel and Barak and Jephthah, and Samuel delivered you out of the hand of, of your enemies. So there in verses uh, 9 through 11, he's describing the time of the judges and what's happened. There's sin on the part of the people and faithfulness on the part of God. And then, after he talks with them about their past sin, of the uh, sin of their fathers, he talks about, in verse 12, their more recent past. He says, when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came out against you, you said to me, no, we, we don't want God anymore, but a, a king to reign over us. So, what's the first thing Samuel does to call the people to love God? It's the same thing you and I must do. We call people to grasp God's goodness and our sin. God is good. God is a God who shows steadfast love. And, and even when we sin, God proves himself faithful. So to, to call them to love God, he, he reminds them of the past. God's faithfulness, their sin. The second thing he does is he talks about their current situation. Look, you are where you are because of your sin, but God has a sovereign and a good hand. Look at verse 13. Here's where you are today, verse 13. Now behold, the king whom you've chosen, for whom you've asked, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. Now, you notice there, there's this contrast. They have sinned. They said we didn't want God to reign over us, and yet God has been faithful. He has appointed a king for them, right? And he's going to talk about how things will continue if they are faithful to the Lord. So in other words, as we encourage people to love God and walk in obedience, we first point them to the past and say, look, we're sinful, God is faithful, but we also, as we want to help people love God and walk in obedience, we want people to find comfort in their current situation. And maybe some of you this morning need to hear some words of gentleness, right? This morning, you find yourself in a situation and the situation which you find yourself in, you say, okay, I'm, I'm here right now because of some past failures. 
I've, I've not treated my family well, or I've, I've made some terrible decisions at work or at school, and, and I find myself in a situation where things seem pretty hopeless. I'm here because of my sin. Does that mean that I'm, I'm here now and I'm outside of God's will and there's nothing that I can do to get back in it, and, and God is just going to let me kind of flounder around and, until I figure out my way out of this? And the answer is no. God has, has placed you here. God continues to love you, and God continues to be faithful. So, the people need a word here this moment as they recognize their sin. They, they need a, a word of comfort, and Samuel is going to provide that. And we do that as well. If we're going to finish our ministries faithfully, we need to constantly remind people of sin, remind people of God's faithfulness, and yet also constantly remind them that God is kind to them and loves them where they are. A third thing that Samuel does here to call people to love God and covenant faithfulness and obedience. He helps people see the different options that are ahead. So he's talked about the past. He's talked about the present. He says, now, here are the different ways that you can go from here. Look at what the text says, kind of beginning there in verse 14. He says, if, so this is one alternative, if you'll fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the command of the Lord, and if both you and your, the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. Okay, so there's option A. That sounds pretty good, right? But there's option B, verse 15. If you will not obey the voice of the Lord but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then, here's, here's, here's the other path, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king now, That's what you need to realize. As you think about your ministry that God has entrusted to you, God is constantly constantly calling you to help people think about their sin and God's faithfulness, to recognize that where they are is not some accident, but there's a kind, loving God that has placed them where they are, and to constantly set before people two paths. Here's the path of of righteousness, of walking in obedience to God, and it's a path on which there is joy and a a path on which there is delight. Psalm 139, verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the the path, the way everlasting. So what we want to do in our ministries is constantly put these two paths before people and say, look, here's if you walk path A, here's the joy and life that God offers. But if you walk path B, the path of disobedience, this is the heartache and the pain and the misery that awaits apart from repentance. The other thing that Samuel does here in these verses is he calls them to see God's power. He calls, he says, look, this is not the the season for this, but I'm going to call upon the Lord. He's in thunder and rain, and that's what happens, and the people fear the Lord and Samuel. Here's the fourth thing that I want you to see. As we think about finishing a ministry well and how to do it, realize, number four, realize your ministry is never over. Uh, The people have, have cried out, to Samuel in verse 19, pray for your, your servants to the Lord, your God, that we may not die. We've added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. And, and Samuel says, look, uh, even though my ministry is, is, is coming to an end, don't be afraid. You've done evil, but, but don't, he kind of repeats the things he's already said. And he, says, and he says also, verse 23, moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way. One of the kindnesses, I think, of the Lord is that even as we bring, even, even as he brings chapters of ministry to a close, they never really fully close, do they, right? Maybe you're a, a parent and you think, boy, my, my kids are, are little now and, and as they get older, that, that ministry is going to come to an end as they leave the house. Ha, right? just gets more fun, right? Even though as, as one chapter of a ministry come, in someone's life comes to a close, that, that, that doesn't mean we stop praying. doesn't mean we stop caring. doesn't mean that we cease to instruct in the ways of the Lord. Our ministry is never fully over and, until the end of this life, right? And that helps us finish well. 
there's young men and, and women I, I worked with in Dallas when I was a youth pastor, and some are, some are in their late 30s. Some are, if I'm going to serve with integrity, some are in their 40s now, right? Still praying for them, caring for them. Those prayers didn't end when my position did. As long as we have consciousness and the ability to pray, eternity has not yet begun. Here's the, here's the last thing that we see that, that I want us to think about. And it's what I want us to think about as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. We need to accept, the fifth thing here, we need to accept that finishing well is about the gospel, not perfection. In other words, finishing well isn't ultimately about our works and words. It's about God's grace. You know, I, I think there are some blind spots in ministry that no matter how much sanctific- sanctification we go through, we'll, we'll never fully see and realize. I, th- I think that's just the reality of the human heart. Samuel here, it, it's interesting. What does he say at the beginning of chapter 12? He says, he says, see, I'm here, and my children are here as well. My sons are, are here as well. Now, what has started this whole mess? Samuel's sons. I'm not sure if he ever fully, at least the text never tells us, he fully grasped how detrimental his sons had been to his ministry and to the ministry to, to Israel here. I'm not sure how much he ever fully grasped that. And yet, he finishes well. But it's not because Samuel is perfect as a, as a father or perfect as a, a judge. It's because his ministry points to a coming king, to a coming covenant of which he is just foreshadowing. He points them to the coming covenant king, to Jesus Christ. I hope we all grow. I hope we grow as employees, as students, as missionaries, as parents, as grandparents. But the, the clock is ticking. <laughs> the clock is ticking, and you still have a long, long way to go. And spoiler alert, you are not going to get where you need to be before eternity comes. So what's our hope? Our hope is, is to be able to come to the conclusion of a ministry and say, look, I'm done. And I have finished well, not on the basis of my own work, but on the basis of the work of Jesus Christ in whom I trust. And I hope that my ministry has pointed the people that God has entrusted to me to Jesus Christ more than myself, because I certainly have not accomplished all that I need to accomplish, we say. Samuel served at a a point in in God's redemptive history to to point people to the new, true, covenant king. And it's that king and that king alone who lived a perfect life. And it is only by being found in that king that we have hope for redemption for ourselves and for others. We serve as temporary stewards of a minuscule portion of God's vast, eternal ministry to his people. And as we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, we're continuing that ministry, right? We're proclaiming our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ to one another this morning. Let's take a moment here. As we get ready to participate in the Lord's Supper, let's, let's remember. My identity is not ultimately as a dad. My identity is not ultimately as a pastor. My identity is not ultimately as a husband. All of those ministries are coming to a close My ultimate identity is found by being in Jesus Christ, by God's grace, through faith in him. As we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, what are we doing? We are proclaiming that we are stewards of temporary ministries by God's grace, and that our hope of eternal life is not in our own works, but in the work of our great King, Jesus Christ. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, first of all, prepare to partake of the bread with me. And before we take the bread, let's just take a moment and and ask God, by his grace, to help us to be faithful in the ministries to which he's entrusted to us, not on the basis of our own work, but on the basis of the work of his son, Jesus Christ.
on the night that he was betrayed, after he had given thanks, Jesus broke the bread and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And if you would prepare to partake of the cup with me, In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. And so we proclaim the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ until he returns. Heavenly Father, we recognize this morning that you and your kindness have brought us eternal life. And you've given us the, these finite lives that, that we live. And you've allowed us to, to do things that, that bring you glory. So help us to toil, help us to labor, help us to be faithful, help us to finish well. Help us to finish well, not by our own strength, but help us to to finish well as we, we recognize that our lives are short. Help us to finish well as we call people to covenant faithfulness to you, to, to love of you. Help us to guard our integrity as we engage in ministry and, and help us to continue to be, be faithful. Help us to trust in your son Jesus this morning. We pray this in his name. Amen.